Michelangelo Thomas was born as the rain season began in June 1951 in a beautiful tropical island that at that time was in the middle of its first revolution, little known to many. At that time, Grenada was beginning the transformation from the post-slavery era, which had officially ended 115 or so years earlier. But a mysterious, eloquent, even elegant, charismatic, very dark-skinned leader had emerged to take on the established planter class and had started a revolt among peasants known as Sky Red. The man's name was Eric Matthew Gary. And Carlos, strangely enough, would carry the charisma, the elegance, and the good looks that that leader had. And he himself would be endeared to many in very much the same manner, leading his own revolution. Carlos was a special young man, born to poor fishermen and fish vendor parents in a fishing village called Guave, a place he would cherish and love and let everyone know of for his entire life. Carlos became one of the talented tenth, one of the very few young men of dark complexion who would get an opportunity to attend secondary school. The British had left a legacy of elitist education designed to keep the majority of blacks on the plantations, allowing only very few the opportunity to become educated, to become teachers and bureaucrats, and whatever else would serve the colonial purpose. Carlos was one of less than 100 youngsters who would get that scholarship to go to the prestigious Grenada Boys Secondary School. And when he got there, he quickly discovered that his ilk, his type, was poorly represented. There weren't many poor black kids from the village in the elitist GBSS. He had many hurts from being called names. One story he once told me was that he became more an organizer for Archer House because although he was one of the faster sprinters, that merit wasn't enough to get him a place on the house team. He recalled the house captain saying to him, sit on boy, only thing you know about is fish. He told that story when he was giving a speech in Mount Rose Secondary. And I asked him, did you just make that up? He told me the name of the person who said that to him. He felt the hurt and he carried it to his entire life. But when served with lemons, he made lemonade. So he didn't become the superior athlete, he became the organizer and the captain. And he said that moment shaped him into being the person who made everything possible for others. There's no coincidence that I define myself as being one of a social conscience. When you're influenced by a person who got beat down time and time again, but got up the next day and went back and organized and put things in place for the very people who tore into his name daily, you have to learn something from it. We couldn't tell him, don't do it anymore if it hurts you so much, because he didn't want to hear that. He just needed to complain to you. And the next day, he did it again. Jillian can tell you how many times we had to deal with the hurt 
when Carlos would literally see a former athlete destitute and promise him a job, well-meaning, but with no plans to get him a job. And then he would go trying to find that job for that person. Sometimes he succeeded, and when he didn't, then he would get the backlash from his good intentions. It happened a lot of times. Carlos' education didn't terminate the GBSS. In those days, there was an option that even a smaller percentage of young people got. It was called the Cambridge Ex Advanced Exams. And Carlos was one of the few from that creaming process, the elite of the elites, to get to the GCE A levels and did that successfully. And GCA levels was enough to allow you to become a teacher. There was a teacher's college, but that was for primary school. And the A levels gave him the opportunity to become a teacher. And there was nothing else that was tailor-made for Carlos more than teaching. He never stopped. He taught and taught some more. And anyone who would listen, he coached and inspired. Carlos, the name, was really just for family and friends. In that culture, the affection of the community meant that everyone who was anyone had to have a nickname. So Carlos would say with pride, whenever he'd encounter a person too old to know who he was, he would say, I'm Carlos, Ducky boy. His father was nicknamed Ducky. And he said it with pride. And if they didn't understand it, but everyone knew Ducky, he would say, Ducky and Miss Popo, that's my parents. And then the very old people would then know who he was. But to the younger people, he was busy. And to the even younger, he was movements. And to his friends in these parts, he was Pluvius. No matter what name you gave him, he accepted it and rolled with it. Movements was what was written on his card. Carlos's excellence had a, more of an impact on me than I knew. You have to stop and think about these things. What you become is a product of what your environment is and who influenced you. And you don't realize it until you stop to think of how it came about. Carlos one day, just out of the blue, came up and said to me, I want to take a team up the islands to play soccer. I think we have a really good secondary school set of players. I want to take them up the islands. I said, oh, sounds good. I didn't realize that that was where Carlos's work ended and mine began. Because Carlos had the best ideas, and Jillian will tell you, then he just dumped them in my lap. And it's like, make it happen. And we did, out of nothing. And I saw George and Cornwall and others remember, I mean, so many of the young men remember that event when Carlos just made it possible for them to go on tour. He just did things like that. And I would get really nervous when Carlos would leave here to go to Grenada because I'd be like, oh my Lord, what is he going to do? And sure enough, he went down and made promises. I'm gonna bring a bunch of secondary school soccer players up here. And he promised them all he would do that. Then he came to me and he said, but we're gonna bring some players up here. And I said, Carlos, you realize the immigration implications, there are all these. He didn't worry too much about the bureaucracy. He just had the ideas. And one of the players he really wanted to come here was a young man named Michael Henry. I think Michael was his first name, he may have lost it. Baby. Baby, Michael, baby, baby Henry. Everyone who remember that kid, Carlos believed was something special as a player. And he would stop at nothing. And he eventually rammed it down my throat and we were going to get baby here. And we had it worked out with uh, Coach Pfeiffer at the time, Kitwana, Chris and Baby. And it didn't happen. I think Neville will remember why. Because Baby drowned just before the semester he was supposed to get over here. That broke Carlos's heart. Hurt him, loved that kid, 
because Baby was a GBSS man that he just wanted that kid to be here. And what consoled him, well, Kim, you kind of jumped me on it, but what consoled him was the way he died. I remember Carlos being proud of the fact that he died trying to get a ball for a kid in the water because it tied in to his love for soccer. That consoled him. It's one of those events I remember him being really distraught and heartbroken over that kid's death. That kid who had no connection to him other than he just loved him as a player. Another thing I recall about Carlos is his balance. You see, Carlos was never mad at you unless you were mad at him. Carlos had no enemies, just detractors. He had critics. Anyone who does anything meaningful is going to be criticized. That's one lesson I took too long to learn from him is that it goes with the territory. He was never dissuaded from anything as a consequence of what the critics had to say. He was Carlos. And when I asked him one time, don't you get tired of your name being ripped to shreds, innocent accusations of things you never did, you never stole a dime in your life, yet they'll make it up? He said to me, Jillian will know this, you grow into it. Time, time. And he told me, I have a song that I like. It's called Both Sides Now. I look at life from both sides now, from win or lose, and still, somehow, it's life's illusions I recall. I really don't know life at all. He loved that song, and that was a philosophy for him. He had a humor like you could not imagine. He could laugh at himself. He teased everyone. He had a nickname, a joke, a line for everyone. You'd walk into the room and he would extemporaneously just make up a story. So Bonston walked in the room and he would say, so I hear you have another lady now. And Bonston would be possibly guilty and wonder, how did Carlos know that? He just made things up. And one conversation I recall, the way the man could laugh at himself. We were talking about, in that town in Guam, where there were some big, strong, robust, physical men, known for that. His father was one of those. He wasn't necessarily. And Carlos said, you know, a lot of these guys are not the most handsome guys you've ever run into, though. And then we got into this conversation, and he says to me, I'm sitting there with him, another friend, Kampesh, and another friend, the Major, sitting right here. The major, will remember that conversation. He said to me, but you could judge a competition, you know, because me, Kampesh, and Major have three of the most ugly fathers in Guam. <laughs> And the whole conversation denigrated to where which one of them had the ugliest father. And Carlos, in his wisdom, said, I'm telling you, the man not good looking. He said, I once asked my mother, but how could you hook up with such an ugly guy? And she said to me, your father could sing. He could sing. He wooed me with his singing. And Carlos, in his dry way, said, I'm glad it's the singing I took from that man. <laughs> and then they continued to debate, and Carlos eased the debate by saying, listen, I don't care what anybody has to say. I'm glad I look the way I do, but I'm proud that my father was the ugliest man in the world. <laughs> he could laugh and tease himself. He could laugh at his Football ability, he was not a great player, but he was a coach ahead of his time. He knew the game intimately. And give Carlos any job, he did it well and went beyond. 
and took everybody else down with him on that job. When Carlos was coaching in Corsicana, and I know, I drove down there with them, we did, him and I, that's all Carlos wanted in life, was someone to give him a team. And when they did, he took that nothing school team and turned it into something amazing. They were winning. They didn't know what that was. There was commitment. The kids were excited about soccer. Carlos transformed that school, not only as a coach. Carlos called me one day. Hey, 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 I'm coming up Saturday. I'm bringing up the team. Okay. Where are you bringing them? I bring them to the house, Jill Pill cooking. It was only later that evening I realized Jillian didn't know they were coming or she was cooking. <laughs> He just basically made that plan, showed up at the house with a bunch of kids, knowing that no matter what, Jillian would do the cooking. So Jillian ran around like a mad woman. I don't know what's wrong with this boy. I didn't even clean my house yet. Cleaning the house, getting ready, and having to cook for Carlos' entire team. I later said to him, did you get parental permission? Did you know you can't do that? Did you know if one of these kids drowned in your pool, you would have a major problem? He never thought through these things. That wasn't Carlos. He just saw a nice day with his team at his house and wondered why not. And so he just did it. That's who Carlos was. Wisdom and knowledge. You get those from him. You get scolded every once in a while and don't know you were scolded. Did I have moments with him? Oh yes. Known him since I was four, but there were three years he did not say a word to me. He was mad at me. Mad. We won't say the reason. But suffice to say, I took comfort in the fact knowing that Julian knew I was innocent. But he put a charge on me that I couldn't defend and we just had to absorb it. And you know what? He was so important to me that I thought, well, I was here and then, you know, I'd be back and forth and I'd get to Grenada and I thought, I just saw him once and I said, enough of this nonsense. I didn't tell him, I didn't tell him, well, Carlos actually was 100% innocent of that charge. I didn't tell him. I just saw him one day and I said, time to make a move. He hadn't really spoken to me for a couple of years. I saw him and said, time to make a move. You know, what are you doing? I'm up there. He barely said, yeah, 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 no thanks. Yeah, okay. I said, make a move. Come on. You've been saying this for the longest while. Break out of this. And the reason I was able to get him, Jillian may not know this conversation, I saw that Carlos was doing, and I knew, Carlos was doing all the work in his job. It wasn't his boss. His boss got the glory and the recognition. But everybody who was in sports knew that everything was done by Carlos. Carlos did not spend time at home. He was gone seven days a week. Every place there was sports to be organized, he did it. And I said to him, Greenwich is your age. He's not going anywhere. You got no place to go. Break out, make a move. And I never expected him to follow up on it. And Carlos said to me, yeah man, we're gonna do it. Except Carlos didn't inform Jillian. <laughs> Once again, Carlos unilaterally made the decision that Jillian was gonna give up her job as a nurse and come to a place she had never heard of. And then just figured that it would fall into place. Jillian, as always, complied. She almost never got, she almost didn't get to Wichita Falls. She got on a plane, they flew to Miami, which you must do from Grenada, cleared immigration, and Carlos, who had a morbid fear of flying, could take no more, could not get on another flight. And so, he made Jillian take a Greyhound bus from Miami, Florida to Wichita Falls for 24 hours and once again she complied and followed 
And she was sitting there boiling in anger and agitation, as Carlos said. There's a black cow. That one's a brown cow. Jill, 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 did you see that speckled cow? And she said, what's my time with you and your cows? And she got to Wichita Falls on a cold, miserable day. And I think she thought this was the place her grandmother called behind God back. <laughs> and she then realized once they got here, Carlos had no plan. Except that they were going to school. I don't think he quite figured out the money either. You know. So Jillian did what Jillian does. She took over the enterprise and made it work. No one, Carlos, Jillian, or myself, would trade the current comfort for those fantastic days of struggle. Beautiful, we're all in school, different places. But it was a fantastic struggle that allowed them to grow together. And Jillian had to now spend the year, and then after a year or so, go back home and now figure out the money because it wasn't quite worked out when she said she was staying here. And I was going to Grenada that year, and Jillian was going, and Carlos whispers in my ear loud enough so Jillian could hear, you going home for carnival. Make sure nobody don't come and wind up behind her. <laughs> that was Carlos's humor. That was the man. When he finally got here, he told everyone, I'm 41 years old. And he used that to encourage the young people. He, tell, he said to them, I didn't have the opportunity, you did. And he was practically a straight A student. He did extremely well. Professors loved having him in class. Dr. LaBeouf loved him. I can't tell the story of the human sexuality class in this venue, needless to say, Carlos made a difference in that class. And Dr. Clark and Dr. LaBeth will never, ever forget it. That was Carlos. And he got a first degree. And he thought and said, that's not enough. He felt the buzz for education and got his master's degree. And I know he appreciated that job at the Boys and Girls Club more than anything else. Why did he love Central? He really liked being on the east side, where he could build an affinity with those kids, because I think they reminded him of his status when he was a child. And boy, we heard every story. He heard every time a parent was neglectful. He took money out of his pocket and brought to kids. He solicited money from friends to help kids. And he made us all buy into his mission. The consummate team player loved sidekicks. You can't say enough about a person who gives and gives and gives some more even when it hurts. But Carlos would tell you if he could lend my voice that he was nothing without Jillian. I can say it and let the record show I have been there. I was there at the wedding. I was there when the house was built, subsequently left, and was there for the last 23 years with them. If there was something negative, he would have said it to me. I can tell you. I'm not trying to elevate my place in his life, but we had a trust. We had a trust and a bond where he knows if he wanted to say something to me, it would stay with me. And I can say he never had a negative word to say about his wife. He had fears, the fear of losing her. Oh my God, she dare not go visit her brother in New York. I'd have to babysit him for the entire weekend, however she, long she was gone, because he was totally dependent on not only her presence, but her spirit. He was nothing without her. I'm single. I'm a confirmed bachelor. And watching the last seven and a half years, 
almost, almost convinced me that I need to be married. Because I have seen the essence of what marriage should be. I have seen what a wife means in sickness and in death, in good times and in bad times. Carlos didn't always achieve well for his family, and Jillian picked up the slack. But Carlos changed the world. I'm blessed. I feel blessed to have known him. I can keep my emotion through all of this. There is no sadness. Everyone else can have that luxury. But I made my peace with him a year ago, and I detached. And I was ready to stay strong, to do this for my brother and my sister. That bond is forever there. And only a person of such magnitude can command such loyalty. May he rest in peace.